let's go ahead and get started and we'll take a look at the VOR. Now this shouldn't be brand new to you because you have a private pilot uh, certificate already. So you did some VOR work uh, in that. You've probably fiddled with them before. Uh, maybe you're using them more pretty actively or maybe you're just relying a lot more on GPS and so the VORs have been a thing of the past a little bit more for you. But let's take a look. Let's bring us all back to the VOR. Okay. First of all, VOR stands for something, right? It stands for very high frequency omnidirectional range. Now if you recall the VOR essentially for all practical purposes puts out uh, 360 degree uh, signals that we can track inbound or outbound to a physical uh, station like you see depicted here. Now when we're going outbound on one of these spokes which we call radials by the way uh, we want to be you know tracking from the station we want to be using a from flag when we come to the station we're tracking to the station so we want a to flag we'll get into that uh, a little bit more now pre GPS days uh, this was a slick and reliable and accurate way of uh, navigating uh, but it has its ups and down points and of course GPS is becoming much more much more the preferred uh, mode of navigation uh, but still very important to understand the VOR if nothing else for a backup navigational system on board the aircraft so let's look at it VHF what does that stand for very high frequency okay so what do we care about that well as opposed to the low frequency or LF frequency range uh, very high frequencies are very reliable so just think of that VHF very reliable they're not subject to the same errors or idiosyncrasies that low frequency uh, deals with for example day night time variances uh, weather uh, seasonal variances co over coastal waters or shoreline disturbances I should say magnetic deposits in the earth and a host of other problems that kind of plague low frequencies now what would that be like well that would be the ADF or the NDB which you do not need to know about uh, anymore since recent changes to the FAA test have occurred so that is fortunate for you we've cut out all the ADF NDB discussions uh, in this class but the very high frequency signal is extremely reliable however there's a couple things you need to know one you need to be in range of the VOR we're going to talk about different types of ranges or classes of VORs to understand how far can you receive this signal for how far will it be reliable for another thing to keep in mind is as the further you get from the station the wider the radial becomes the wider or sloppier if you will the radial becomes as, as you get closer to the station these radials all compact and the signals are a lot tighter and therefore even more accurate if you will so just because you're centered up on a radial but you might be 30 miles away may not be exactly where you think you are just because the width of the radial is sort of cone shaped it's gonna it's gonna broaden out the further it gets away from the station but we also have line of sight issues and that's the one downside of the very high frequency is that you have to have what's called line of sight do you remember that and that's where nothing can block or obstruct the signal between the station and your aircraft antenna so for example if you're at a lower altitude and you're in a valley and there's a mountain and on the other side of that mountain is the VOR station you're not going to get that signal even though you might be within the allowable range of that VOR nothing can obstruct that line of sight between you and the antenna so you have to have line of sight which may mean you need to increase your altitude Omnidirectional just means, omni means all, so all directions. So we can think of this as 360 degrees around. We can get on any one of those uh, 360 degree radials that come outward from the station. And then range is an old fashioned term. We won't worry about that. Now in reality, what the VOR actually has is only two signals only two signals. And what it does is it sends out a master signal or a primary signal. Or stationary signal and then it has a secondary signal that's sweeping kind of like a sprinkler head if you will that's just kind of rotating around and it's going pretty fast it's usually about 30 times per second and what your VOR receiver in the aircraft does is it compares the time delay or the phase delay between what is noted as the primary or stationary signal and where the sweeping signal hits you 
and then it measures that difference between the primary signal and the secondary signal and it figures that out in an angular answer and then you register the particular radial that you're on. The Victor Airway system is built on this and if you recognize this uh, type of a chart. You may not recognize the exact location, but uh, this is a sectional, a VFR sectional chart. And if you look along here, you can actually see some airways on here. It can almost get lost if you just learn to ignore it. But we have Victor. The airway system is based off the V, VOR, Victor airway system. We have 222 here, and we have Victor 463 here, and here we have Victor uh, 325 and all of them intersect. You can see these arrows point to where the station is, the nearest station that defines this what we call intersection. That intersection's name is WOMAC in this case. WOMAC. And so the airway system is really the highway in the sky for the instrument pilot. Now you can go off airways, you can go direct to airports or direct to nav aids, uh, you can get permission by ATC to do that, but otherwise you're flying these highways of the sky called airways, which are, you may have remembered this in your private pilot days, eight miles wide, four miles each side of the center line uh, of an airway, that protected airspace. Now this isn't the same location, but this is a, another type of chart. This is an actual IFR chart. Uh, put out by the government, so the NOS version, and you can see it looks different, doesn't it, than the standard VFR charts. It's really kind of uh, cleaned up and it really emphasizes the VOR system and the airways, which are nice and bold black here. And uh, we'll go over these things specifically later, but we can see the radial here given off of the 230 degree radial off the Seattle VOR, and there's an intersection here. Uh, called Caro, but this is just a little look at what an IFR chart looks like. Now the VOR receiver, which can come in many different forms, uh, you may be flying a glass cockpit like a G1000 or an Avidyne or some type of product like that. This is the Bendix King KX155, a popular radio back in its day. And you can see it's got a COM and a NAV, so this is a NAV COM. We have over here our communications side, which we can access through these knobs, standby frequency and active frequency. Same thing over here on the nav side. And by the way, this uh, the frequencies put in here demonstrates the range of the VOR uh, frequency range band. We've got 108.00 to a frequency of 117.95. And so that is the frequency in megahertz uh, that we can find VORs, VOR frequencies. Now, a standard VOR indicator, again, I realize this should be review for most of us, so that's why I'm going to move it along a little bit. Uh, we have a azimuth here, which is rotatable by, via a OBS knob or omni bearing selector. We get to select it by twisting this knob and that rotates this whole card. This is a very traditional type of display. And what's up top here is the one that is selected. In this case, we have the 360 or north degree radial, it looks like, or close to that. And uh, we have, you know, numbers every 10 degrees of a larger line here and a smaller line at every 5 degree increments. And so you can count those out there. Uh, we have a dot system down below here, which shows us how far off from the selected course we are via the CDI or course deviation indicator. And a good way to look at this is, this is your course that you selected. We selected the 360 radial from whatever VOR this is. Well, this is telling us that the radial is off to our left. Think of the circle as the center point as you. Think of that as your airplane. And notice it doesn't show us really which way we're flying in this case because we're not necessarily flying north. We don't see a compass here. We don't see a heading indicator or an HSI. So we really don't know what the heading of the aircraft is. And by the way, neither does the VOR. The VOR does not know which way you're headed to or from. We have to tell it that with the to from flag. And so we need to make sure that we uh, select the correct flag. And I'll talk about that more in just a moment. But in this case here, our selected course is off to our left. Think of this as an overhead view, a bird's eye view of your airplane here, and the course off to the left. Each dot is worth two degrees off course, so we got two, four, six. Looks like we're seven degrees off course. And you can have a maximum of five dots or 10 degrees off course. Beyond that, the needle would be pegged 
and we would have to certainly turn the OBS uh, knob to find out how far, how many degrees off course we really are. So once again, very simply put, uh, we don't know what our heading is here yet, but I would need to fly toward the northwest headings to get onto this radial if I intend to fly a 360 from the station. Now what heading would I fly? Well, it just depends how far I flip, believe I am from the station because the further I am from the VOR station, remember I said the wider that VOR radial is and so it's going to take a lot more mileage to travel through radials. But if I'm close to the station, I may not need much of an intercept heading at all. I may only choose 5 or 10 degrees. It also depends where the wind is coming from. And so if I've got a lot of crosswind coming out of the northwest, so I'm fighting or bucking that, that headwind trying to get over to that radial and maybe add insult to injury, I am 30 miles from the station, I'm really far, well I'm going to want to take a pretty aggressive intercept angle to the northwest, maybe a 300 heading or a 310 or a 320 or something like that to bite back into this. But if I'm close to the station, I'm, not, I'm going to want to be, I want to calm that intercept angle down a little bit and ease my way over so as to not overshoot through that as I intercept it. Now remember all VOR radials come out from the VOR so all radials are really from the VOR. Here's, here's kind of a couple rules I want to give you. All right, Derek Metro's VOR tracking rules. Number one, always fly from the station with a from and fly to the station with a to. Okay, what do I mean? Well, if you're flying away from the station, make sure that you have a from flag there. Now, if I twist this OBS knob around so that south is up top here, in other words, 180 degrees, I spin that around, this will read two. But I might actually be on a 360 heading. I'm flying from the station. That would confuse the VOR, and the VOR would think we're heading to the station when we're not, and you get what's called reverse sensing. Well, how you can avoid that is always make sure if you know you're flying away from the station, make sure that you've put a radial up top here that gives you a from flag. Fly from with a from. And if you're flying to the station, make sure that you in fact have a to flag here. And those flags might look different. Some in this case says FR and then there's pointing sort of down. Uh, others may have just the, the pointer there, the little triangle going down for from and pointing up flipping up to a for a two indication. So you have to learn your system. But you've probably heard me by now from with a from and two with a two. It'll cut out the reverse sensing. The second rule of thumb that I want to give you is that your heading that you're flying should be the same or very close to the OBS selected heading. The heading under the index here that you've chosen. So in other words if I've chosen north or 360 well that ought to be the heading that I'm flying and notice I said or close to that. Why? Well because one if I'm off the course like in this case I need to fly another heading, an intercept heading to get back on that. Okay. Once I get on it, if there's wind, think of a crosswind, right? Think about your cross countries you planned uh, where you have a crab angle, right? You're flying maybe a north heading or, or a north course, a 360 course, but maybe you've got to fly a 350 heading, right, to adjust for wind, to crab into that wind. Same thing with a VOR. You're wanting to fly the 360 uh, radial. Notice we've slid off to the right the course is to our left. That might be because of wind. Maybe we wandered in our heading, maybe we didn't. We'll say we didn't because we're super good pilots. We held our heading and it was wind that drifted me off. So when I get that radial back to center, I might want to choose a different heading other than 360 to hold the 360 radial. Maybe I want to choose 355, maybe I want to choose 350, but something of a crab angle into that wind to maintain that. So notice my second rule of thumb was fly a heading that's the same or close to the heading that you've chosen as the radial. So the two rules of thumb, fly from with a from, two with a two, that's the correct flag. Second thing is fly the same heading or close to the same heading as you've selected as your radial and you will do yourself some great favors. Let's look at this and kind of put this together because you might be thinking